Hey, top of the morning to you. Michael here. Grandkids call me Ruth. Thanks for being on Good News Ruth this morning. And remember, it's uh, it's really not my good news. Uh, it's good news to me. And my job is just to kind of do what John was doing here, point to good news. And I've been doing that by myself for a long time. Just, um, well, in community, have some dear friends, but also just sort of reading these uh, small uh, gospels and taking them to heart. And now... Um, starting last year with you people on Patreon and now on this YouTube page, my job, uh, it's not my job, it's, it's my joy <laughs> to, uh, to just tell a story and do a quick doodle. And why do I do that? A reminder, I do that because a picture really does paint a thousand words for me. Uh, okay, so maybe it's not a thousand, but maybe if it's just five more words that causes me to remember, recall, uh, readdress, reiterate, refresh, all the re-words. I love Rewords. Renew that spirit in me. Reconnect those thoughts. Anyway, so those are fun words to do. So here we are. Uh, a few people on this morning. I'm just going to get started. We're in the Gospel of John and we're taking off in. Uh, 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 we were in John 1, and you know what happens uh, right out of nowhere. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, the light has come. Boom, there's the first drawing. The light has come. Now when I see this, I remember the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. This music will be over here in about 30 minutes or so, and then I'll just let that go. And then here's another shot of that sun coming down. And this is where John the baptizer comes in. John the revealer. John the newscaster. John the wild man from the woods who comes in with his vest on of... Uh, a camel hair and uh, a leather belt and maybe his satchel and a, and a stick he carries around, you know, to uh, ward off whatever, but also to help him cross the streams. And it looked like a shepherd's staff. Uh, I assume it did. He brings it in. He doesn't, he, he just comes in and says, I'm here to tell you that you better reshape your lives. God's new order, God's new commandment is coming, and he's confronting you to do that. He was a prophet that come that had come before God, except that he says under his own volition and his own truthfulness, he says, I, I'm coming, I got here before to tell you about this one that's coming after me, but really he was here before I was. <laughs> And that's a, that's a good trick. And so here's where Jesus finds out what he's doing. People are saying, wow, John's baptizing people in the river of Jordan. You better go see what he's doing. Is he the Christ? Is he the Messiah that, that has been long promised in the words of history? Remember, culturally and contextually, the, the Jewish people knew that the Messiah was supposed to come. It has been foreshadowed since the dawning of the earth. Since the wheels fell off in the Garden of Eden and man broke that commandment with God and, and disobeyed and it fell apart, there had to be a sacrifice for the brokenness, the sin. So they know that this Messiah is supposed to come. John comes in and says, repent, I'm baptizing you now. There's one coming who's greater than I. I'm not even fit to do his sandals. And then he baptizes Jesus, and people can't figure out what's going on. And we picked it up right here. This week, we're in the second chapter. That's where the Spirit of God comes down like a dove and witnesses, witnesses the baptism and says, there, he did it. In, in the culture, when you went into the baptism, you, into the mikvah, into the, the, the renewing bath, uh, the, the, the baptism. You had to have someone, or in lots of cases, there was someone who witnessed that to say, every follicle of hair went under, he did it. And so in this case, a dove comes down and lights on him, and the voice comes out and that people could hear and says, this is my son and who I'm pleased, he did it. Okay, that was the verification of that. So then we pick it up in chapter uh, if you're if you're following along in your Gospel according to John in the Crossway paper version here, I love this little Bible. It's thin. It fits in my backpack in my in my man bag very easily. This uh, this paper is kind of thin, 
So all the practicing that I've been doing for years, painting on thin paper and drawing paper and sketch paper, it's not it's not heavy watercolor paper, but you can paint on it pretty well. It's kind of bright white, so it holds color. Here it is uh, against uh, a small drawing pad, sketching pad. You can see there's a little bit of differentiation there. Uh, so here's what happens. The next day, so this is the next day, picks up in verse 35. The next day, John, uh, thanks for being on the show this morning. Thanks for sharing this page, Good News Room. It's on YouTube. That's where you're finding it. You can go back and watch it there. They all lock in. You can find them under the tab called Live. And so if you subscribe there, a little bell will ring, you know, or you'll say, oh, he's he's live. I better go see it now. Plus, you can share it with your friends. How do they find it? Just go to YouTube and search Good News Rue. And uh, there's some videos there. There's an intro there about the books are there. So if you want to bring people along with you, please do so. Why would you want to do that? Well, that's exactly what John is doing here. He's trying to bring people along with him to say, this is not about me. This Good News Roo show is not about me. This is about me talking about one who is greater than me. And I'm not trying to be uh, false humility uh, speaking here. I'm just trying to say, that's really what this is about. It's about telling other people. What was John doing? He was pointing to Jesus saying, no, 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 it's not me. I'm not Elijah. I'm not some, I, I'm not one of the, oh, I'm not Ezekiel. I'm not, no, I'm not Isaiah. I am John the Baptist. I've been in the bushes forever. I've come out of the woods because it's my time to say, reshape your lives. God's coming. And he's coming in a form that you're not going to believe. And so the next day, John is back at the river. The religious right can't figure him out. He's standing there with two disciples. Now note that he's written this. John, the writer of this book, is possibly one of these disciples. So he's doing a little bit of a, a third person. He's standing there with two of his disciples. Jesus hadn't even called disciples yet before this baptism. But he's saying there were two of these people standing there. We think one of them was probably John who wrote this book, and we think one may have been Andrew, okay? And that's a good choice, and here's why in just a second. Andrew was a pointer also. He was a go-getter. He was someone who would go grab somebody else. So the next day, John was standing with his two disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now, the people standing around, when he said the Lamb of God, they went, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold, hold on just a second. See, they knew that language too. Not only did they know that a Messiah was supposed to come, but they knew the Lamb. And in fact, the message is pretty clear. Uh, it says it in modern day language. I think he says it right here. He says, here he is. <laughs> Don't you love that? Here he is, God's Passover Lamb. When you say Passover lamb to this audience, they get it. They immediately connect that Passover was, remember, if you see the movie Ten Commandments, the Passover is where they had to, to paint the door, the blood on the door jams so that, the, that the, uh, the Spirit of God would pass over and spare those children. The Passover lamb saw God's people as free from sin. And so he saw them holy and blameless. This is what the gospel is about, that when you are, really go back to my old uh, country days in the church, when you're washed in the blood of Jesus, you are seen as God's holy person. It's crazy, isn't it? Who can figure it out? I just believe it to my core. So there's a lot of figuring that I don't do, but there's a lot of theology and context context to this and cultural uh, concepts that if you dig into them, you really realize, oh my goodness, he just used the words Passover lamb. There's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. See, on Passover, you had to kill a, you had to slaughter, you had to sacrifice a unblemished lamb. And in doing so, the blood of that lamb was sprinkled in such a way that God had written the, the commandments and the laws back then to say, this is what you have to do on this time period to be seen by me because I can't look on sin. God is holy and blameless and without sin. Man is sin. 
And so here John knows that. It's revealed to him even when he was a, a young man, I'm sure. But he's studied these ways and he's walked with God. And then he comes out of the wilderness, makes himself known, and he says, this is Passover lamb. He forgives the sins of the world. This is the man I was talking about, the one who's coming after me, but is really ahead of me. He's repeating this. I knew nothing about who he was, only this, that my task has been to get ready, get Israel ready to recognize him as the God revealer. This is why I came here baptizing you with water. You give you a good bath and scrubbing your sins from your life, but you're going to get a fresh start with God. John clinched this witness by saying this, he goes back and he repeats what he saw. I watched the Spirit of God come out of the sky, making himself known and at home in Christ. The one who authorized me to baptize with water told me, the one with whom the Spirit will come down and say, and stay, the one will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what I saw happen. And I'm telling you, he says, with his old mountain man finger. I just visioned him as this old mountain man who came out of the wilderness, the Judean wilderness, the countryside. And he says, this is the son of God. So there he is the next day baptizing. The people can't figure out who he is. The next day, John comes back and he's standing at his post again with these two disciples and they're watching. And he says, look, there he is. There's God's Passover lamb. And the two disciples heard him say that out loud. Maybe John, maybe Andrew, we think. And Jesus looked over <laughs> his shoulder and he said to them, what are you after? What are you after is a great way to say, what do you want? What is it you want? Why are you looking at me like that? What are you after? Are you after something for you? Are you after something that I have? Are you after me? That's a great question for us to ask and to answer sometimes. Then they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, wh where are you staying? And he said, come and see for yourself. And they said, okay, we'll go. And they wound, it up, they wound up staying with him for a day. And it was late afternoon when this happened. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one who heard John witness followed, so it was Andrew. And the first thing he did after was that he said, I got to go tell my brother about this. So Andrew runs down and he tells his brother. Remember who his brother was? Cephas. In Aramaic, that word means rock. He was Peter. And, and they called him Peter. They called him Simon Peter. But then later on in the, in the scriptures, you'll see Jesus brings back. He says, your name means rock. I'm going to call you the rock. That was later on up in the little town of Caesarea Philippi where Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And Peter answers him the truth. You're the son of the living God. They didn't know who this man was at the time, but they knew they were hoping that he was the Passover lamb. They were hoping that he was a rabbi. They were hoping that he was a teacher and that that rabbi, that teacher, that person would give meaning to their life. All these young men wanted that because they had been taught that since they were small. The work we have today is kind of like John the Baptist. We are supposed to point to Jesus. We're supposed to say, let me help you find who he is. Let me help you learn about him. That's what we're supposed to do. That's why we get these words in our heart to realize God hasn't changed. We have. And so here's what I thought I'd paint today. I thought I'd paint this little scene. I started just doodling some men. There they are right there. Rue, which book are you reading from? Uh, uh, I'm, I stopped over and put it in modern day language. I'm back to the gospel of John right now. And so I'm reading this. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip and he said, follow me. And Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And uh, so Jesus is calling his first disciples. But two of those that heard him speak, heard John speak and they followed Jesus and Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So it's the same text here. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And that's from verse 35 down to about verse 40. So that's where you can catch me on the same same translation you're using. Sorry, I skipped ahead there. Sometimes I'll read two or three versions. And, and I don't want you to think I do that all the time. But yes, sometimes I do. Here's the one we're going to paint in. Here's the message version. This is just simply called the message. It's in modern day language. It was translated by Eugene Peterson. 
It's from Navigator Press. There it is, Nav Press. It's, it's called The Message. And uh, this one is actually just the New Testament. I have one that's the entire Bible. And then sometimes I'll read out of this Bible too. And this is the Life, it's New International Version, but it's a Life Application Bible. And this is a really handy Bible because of all the notes it has. And so I can read this. And then there's commentaries down here that really help me with some of the stories to put things together. Like, for instance, in John this morning, I marked it here. You see, not only do you see what's going on with the disciples following Jesus, but you'll even get a little map sometimes down here that'll show you these cities. Here's Samaria. There's Judea. Uh, there's Capernaum. Uh, this is Decapolis, which was the 10 cities that bordered the Dead Sea, excuse me, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, well, and the Dead Sea on this side. So for me, this is very helpful. And if you've ever been to Israel, and by God's grace, we we want to go again. We've been there three times. These stories come to life because you get to walk, not just on the exact places. I don't want to say, oh, yeah, I stood there where Peter, you know, uh, went and got the fish. No. But you're in that area, and it's a small, small country. And so you really realize that of all the places in the world that God touched down, he chose to touch down in Israel. It's the center of everything and where it started. And there he comes walking up on the river bank, on the Jordan River, uh, coming down from Mount Hermon through Caesarea Philippi. This windy comes out of the, the uh, up around Dan, D-A-N, and it bubbles up from the spring and it feeds the Jordan and then it gets wide and a little muddier, but not too wide. And then it rolls into, of course, the Sea of Galilee. And then the Sea of Galilee dumps it off into the Dead Sea where it, it's dead. It dies there. No animals living in the Dead Sea. So so that's kind of how I, I read that, if that helps you. Uh, but what I decided to draw was some of these little people. Now, I'll do this from time to time. And I'm getting better at drawing these people, but I'll just grab a little note card, one of my little uh, drawing pads sometimes, and I'll, yeah, I will, I'll practice. I draw, if, if I were drawing all these in rooster people, I'd just sketch them because <laughs> I've done thousands of roosters. That's what Rue does. But if I were doing this in, in people and in walking people and standing people and biblical people, I'll just do a little uh, sample piece like this. So I'll, I'll grab this person and I'll draw his, his headband like this. There he is right there. See that? And I'll do his shoulders out here and then maybe bring this around and maybe this sleeve, you know, and, and uh, maybe he's got a, a belt here that's got some lines on it and it's cut away. And then I'll, I'll draw this down here and like this. And so suddenly, and maybe there's a beard. And so suddenly I have this little biblical person that at the distance looks real to me. Well, it doesn't look real, but you know what I mean. It looks acceptable to tell a story with. So maybe this is John the Baptist. Maybe he's come out of the wilderness and he's got on his his camel hair vest. And he's, uh, I don't know, I don't think he had a hat on. I think he came out of there with his hair all over the place. I think he was wild looking. So for me, that's what I'm going to draw. I'm going to draw Jesus standing around with a couple disciples. And I'm going to take a pen. Uh, I'm just going to use an 05 here. Let's see if I've got one handy. Uh, should have, right? I changed my gears right then. Yep, here's one right here. Just an 05 pintail pin. And I'm just going to do a, a little piece right here. And so I think I, want, uh, I think I want a figure over here that's walking toward them a little bit. And then I want some guys, and maybe this, the, the Sea of Galilee here. There's some little trees and land. And then there's the water here. And then on, over here on this bank, I've got these guys standing here. And they're looking over there, and one of them's pointing at him like this. And this guy has got, he does have the staff. He's pointing like that. He's looking down. He's looking like this. You see where I'm headed with this drawing here? And maybe he's got another guy standing next to him just like this. See how fast those little guys come together there? If I want to make them a little taller, I can add to their heads, put 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 a little bit of a robe on them like this. This guy's out here. And maybe there's one more guy here who's here. Watch this guy right here. He's sitting on the stone. He's sitting here on this rock. And 
because you're on the edge of the lake, so you got to have some stones there. And so maybe there's some... Okay, so uh, here's here's the story that says, uh, hey, look, it's God's lamb. So now when I go to paint that, by just putting those words in my own paraphrase, I'm not trying to change scripture. I'm not trying to add to it. I'm not trying to take away from it. That's not my job. My job is not to uh, explain this in some theological depth of, oh, here's what was taking place. No, it's just to see the simple story that says, John is standing near the water, took up his place again the next day. He was there for a short amount of time. He's already baptized Jesus the day before, word spread, more people are coming by. And so now if I know there's more people coming by, guess what I'm doing here? I'm just going to add some people standing around and they're all, they've all come out. So I can add all kinds of people. See, these are the living drawings. I can go back and add as many as I want to any point, any time. I can just, it's, it's my artwork. And I, and remember, this is not artwork that you're trying to put into a gallery somewhere. This is artwork that's just helping you remember this story. So here we go. Let's say that this is John here. Let's say that this is John the Baptist. Let's say this is uh, the uh, Apostle John who wrote this book. And let's say that this is Andrew here. Okay. And then all these are just everybody from the religious folks who came from everyday farmers who said, we're going back out on the Jordan today because that wild man has come out of the woods and he's, he's calling the somebody to repent. We better go find out what he's about. And so there's my story. I've just created this little story. It's as simple as that. And that's what I want you to look at. For me now, I just grab a, a quick brush and maybe a little of my colors and I just add a little bit of color to this to just make it work. So I'm just going to go and get some beige or a little brown here. And I'm, John the Baptist has got to be brown. He's got on camel hair. Uh, maybe some of these other guys are just in gray. You know, maybe Jesus is just in sort of a gray piece. If I grab a little bit of uh, this right here and let it come in. Um, if I wanted to, I could come back in here with a little bit of this pen and create some shadow. So I did the beard with that. Maybe there's a person here that just has a little bit of blue. So maybe there's a lady in the crowd who's wearing a, uh, you know, blue was pretty expensive to come by back then. Um, some of the blue they say came from snails. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Uh, so you had to have a lot of snails to create the dye for this. And, and maybe there's a little bit of a a green and maybe there's some more beige and just pen and ink. So I've got these people. Uh, it'd be really easy now to come in here and create some. Uh, let me create this rock that that James is sit or uh, I said Andrew is probably sitting on. Now why did I paint it that color? Uh, because you're in Israel and everything that I've ever seen in Israel is just about that color right there. And then I'm gonna throw a little bit of this here, a little bit of this water right here, and a little bit of blue with this. And I'm going to create the water out of this right here, just like Jesus is coming along on the Jordan River. He's walking along the seashore. This is going to be a little bit of greenery out here because we do have some trees and stuff. So, so there's my little painting. I just have this community of people, and he's pointing, saying, there he is. There's the Lamb of God. All right? So that's my story. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and there he found Philip. And he said to him, follow me. So he's picked up John and Andrew. And then Andrew goes down and gets his brother and says, hey, uh, Cephas, uh, Rock, Peter, you got to come with me. I, th I think he's here. What do you mean you think he's here? I think he's here. This is not scripture. I'm just telling you as a storyteller brother, Andrew says, I better go get my brother. There's something bigger happening here than just a guy that shows up and when the heavens open up and, and a dove comes down and rests on him and a voice says, my son with whom I'm pleased, that's enough to sign and go, it's not your everyday normal dude that was baptized here. This is somebody else. And then this guy who acts like a prophet says he's not, but he's calling everybody to repent and he's saying, there's the Lamb of God. That's God's Passover lamb. 
Don't you see? It's the one and the same. It's God coming to say once and for all, you're not going to have to have a slaughter system, a sacrifice system of killing lambs anymore. That's done. I'm coming so that you might know that that's my job to take the sins of mankind from the beginning to the end, because it's not just for those that died, that, that had, had, had been alive when he was alive. It's for people from the start of time until now, because why? Well, there's no time limit on God. He says, I am. John refers to him as that later on. We're going to read about the I am statements. He says them seven or eight times. I am the bread of life. I am the one. I am come that you might have more life. I am the bread. I am the light. Okay, so he didn't say I was, I will be. He said I am. And that in itself means that he supersedes all time. So that's why God can die for us then and still is still a true message for today. So here's my story for that. Now, I can turn the page, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to let you do this one in this next week, but I'm going to start on it. Right after this, Jesus has gotten, uh, Nathaniel comes, he sees Philip, and he says, well, how do you know it was me before Philip called you? How'd you, how'd you know this? And Jesus said, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree. And he goes like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean I saw you under the fig tree? Nobody was there with me. It's a great story up around uh, 147, 48, 49. And he says, truly, you will see heaven open and the angels of God descending and ascending with the Son of Man. You haven't seen anything yet. You think I couldn't see you when you were sitting in a city away under the fig tree over near Nazareth? So Jesus has put some of his disciples together and then they go to a wedding in Cana. And on the third day of the wedding in Cana, we've got five minutes to go here. The mother of Jesus was there and Jesus was at the wedding with his disciples. He's still got a few guys that he's going to collect, but he's putting a team together. He's putting a group of young men together who many of them had been passed over by other rabbis. Many of them were fishermen because that was their trait. They, uh, they didn't know much about farming, but they lived in the, on the Sea of Galilee around that area. So most were fishermen. So Jesus uh, took him with him. Hey, we're, I got to go over to Canaan. It's uh, my dad's uh, the carpenter. He well, my dad God, but my earthly father Joseph is a carpenter, and they're building some things. There's a friends having a wedding, and let's go to the wedding. And so they went to the party, and and uh, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus, I'm in mean, chapter two, said to him, "Hey, son, they have no wine." And Jesus is going like. What am I supposed to do? I, my time has not come yet. My, my time has not come. Mom, my time has not come. I'm just putting my group together and I'm just getting organized here. And the mother of Jesus says to him, do something. And he says, my time has not yet come. And you know what his mother said to the servants? She walks off and goes, just do whatever he tells you. But, but, but okay. All right, he says to the servants, go get me those big water jars that are out there. The ones that the people come by on the dusty road and they wash their feet in before they come into the house. The ones that hold around 20 or 30 gallons each. Go go bring those in here. Rinse them out and take them down and fill them up with clean water and then bring them back. And they're going like, okay. And, and you can imagine the disciples going like, what is he going to do with this foot bath of water. And so he went out there and he got these big clay jars. There were three of them and he had them rinse them out a little bit and fill them up with water. And then I don't know what he did. I don't know how it happened. There were six of them actually says six stone jars for the Jewish rites of purification. So I don't know if they were jars like this. I'm going to draw another one that I've seen in Israel. I don't know if they were like this. And they were leaning on something here like so. 
and they may, this could be the field jar that you poured the water into here. So regardless, I don't know. I won't know until I see them someday. <laughs> and I've looked at lots of artifacts in Israel. So was it this kind or this kind? I'm not sure. The point is, it doesn't matter to me. I don't have to get, it, it, was it a mug cup or was it a china cup or was it thin and light and for teas with your finger up with the queen? What, what was it? I don't know. Okay, a couple more minutes here and you'll see where I'm headed with this and then you can finish your drawing. But each of these held 20 to 30 gallons. So these usually only held three to five gallons. So it's probably one of these big laven like full so you could step in it and wash your feet and probably had a servant there who had some some sort of uh, uh, knitting uh, cloth put together, a towel of some sort. I don't know what they called it at the time. So these became big basin that people stepped in. He said, fill the jars with water and they filled them to the brim. And he said, now I need you just to take some of the water out. So maybe you dip this in, you take it and, and a smaller one of these. So maybe there was another pitcher there like so. And maybe he said, dip some of that out and I need you to take it to the host, the master of ceremonies, and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it and the master of the feast, he doesn't know all this has gone on. They pour him some out in his, in his pottery goblet. Can you imagine being the guys who filled him up with water in the foot baths? And then took it to him and says, because mother, Jesus had just said, whatever he tells you. So he said, look, fill those up with water and then now uh, dip some out and take it to the master of the ceremonies. They're going to like, this is my last job. They're going to fire me today. I'm done here. And then lo and behold, he tasted the water and he said, whoa. Most people, he called the bridegroom in. He says, everyone serves the good wine first. And then when people have had too much to drink, they start putting out the cheap stuff. Not the case for this family. They have saved the best wine until last. That's how I remember the Cana wedding. Jesus creates the best wine the party's ever had. And he creates it in some foot washing tubs. Love that story. But you keep the good wine until now. This was the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples, hear me out, believed in him. And after he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, they stayed there for a few days. We'll pick it up on uh, chapter 13 or verse 13 where Jesus, uh, and if you want to keep going and reading these and paint your picture, please do. And I'll just back up and we're going to start skipping through. So we, we're catching everybody up and then we're going to take off a little bit and go a little bit quicker as we get through this. Hey, it's nine, uh, it's, yes, it's 930. And so that's good news. According to John, you saw him call some disciples and you saw his first miracle. Paint something that helps you remember, renews your thoughts and moves you forward in that. You have one job. It's to point people to the good news. In this case, in every case, if it's really scriptural good news, it's the person of God. It's Jesus in this case. That's what John's job was, to point people to Jesus. What's your job? Blessings for being on this. I don't like wine, but I bet I would have liked Jesus' wine. <laughs> uh, sometimes moms can't help but put their kids on the spot. I love that. I love it that his mother pushes him into the first miracle. Do whatever he tells you. Don't you just love that? I mean, read it in your Bible. It says, but mom, mom, my time hasn't come yet. This thing's been orchestrated in a bigger picture than you. She'll do whatever he says. Blessings to you all. Hey, I'm going to switch over and do a little bit of... Uh, <sighs> Think like an artist right now on another page. So blessings to you all and keep the good news rolling out from wherever you are. Thanks for being on today. Blessings to you. I'm finished up right here. Boom.